Gold Trails and Ghost Towns with Mike Roberts and Bill Barley. And welcome to another edition of Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts with Bill Barley, our uh, resident expert when it comes to uh, gold trails, ghost towns, former school teacher, placer miner, author. But did you ever get rich, Bill? I've been on good th three good strikes, Mike, but that's, um, that's not always rich in the, in the placer fields. And that's probably another story. It is indeed. We have done things now from the Silvery Slow Can to Dawson, but where are we going today? Where are we going to look at today? One of my favorite areas, Mike, although it's, 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 it's been in the decline for the last, I would think, at least 80 years, and it's an old town called Yale, once the metropolis of the Fraser River. And Yale, of course, was one of the earliest of the gold towns in the Fraser River Rush. This was in 1858. And it was the head of navigation, so the stern wheelers came up to Yale, and because of that, Yale became a bustling boom town and lasted that way right through the 1850s, right into the 1860s, went into a period of decline, and then when the railroad started to build through the canyon, the Canadian Pacific, came back into, for a, into the spotlight for a few brief years and then declined again. But it's the story of those prospectors going to the Caribou Gold Fields that sets this story up. Basically. Okay, come back in just a second and we'll talk about the town of Yale on the Fraser River and tell some great stories. We'll be back in just a second. Over the past few shows, most of the dates we've been talking about have been in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, yeah. but this, we're going right back to the origins of British Columbia with our talk about Yale today. Yeah, essentially why British be Columbia became a crown colony and later a province. So we're talking about the Fraser River Gold Rush, which started in 1858, uh, you know, really got it, it, its impetus then. It probably started in 57, Mike, but because of the Fraser River Gold Rush, a string of towns built up first up the Fraser and then eventually into the Caribou. Now the Fraser was the primary route for the prospector to go. This was the highway of the early, 1800 and, early 1860s and late 1850s. So in other words, the steering wheelers came up from New Westminster across from Victoria into New Westminster and then of course up the Fraser, right up to, originally up to Fort Hope and then it made the jump from Fort Hope to Fort Yale. Fort Yale became the head of navigation. All right. This is, the first shot is of the kind of man that made his livelihood there. And this is the man after whom uh, all these stories of gold trails and ghost towns are, of course, named. Who's this man? Who do you this think is, this man is? This is a typical miner of the 1850s, a painting by Hind. And uh, it shows him with his gold pan and with the various other things he needs, the miner's pick and the boots and so on. He's looking in the pan for color and, of course, this is the, the typical view that the average individual thought of as the miner, the lonely prospector looking for, for gold in some, some forgotten stream from somewhere. This is sort of a, a romantic artist's conception of him, or was this a, a, did that miner commission Hind to paint him? It's both. It's both. It is, it was, as far as we know, we don't know the individual in, in, in the painting, but it is kind of a romantic view, but a typical view as well. We, so much of the work at this time was done by artists, and some of it was not particularly accurate art. Who's the man who did this? This is an example. We don't know the individual who did this. This was done for Harper's Magazine in 1858, the earliest known view of Yale. But he was not there, Mike. Yeah. There's another picture uh, we'll that, that he did on second. this of Fort Langley, but, and it was accurate, but this picture of Yale is not accurate, and you'll see that. You can see the background in this particular picture. You can see the fort itself, but the fort was not like yeah. that, nor is the background like that, nor is the forefront down by the river like that. So it wasn't nice and straight where you see all those tents lined up. No, it wasn't. It wasn't that kind of a fort that's got sort of a, uh, uh, a caisson at each end of the, no. of the wall. No. Okay, who is the man who did this for Harper's? We don't know. It's okay. just one of the Harper's artists. And uh, he spelled Fraser wrong. This is the first, one of the first photographs 
this gives you a better look. Yes, it does. And it shows how, how incorrect the, the view by Harper's Artist was. Although Harper's was a good magazine. This is low water, is it? This is low water. Probably, uh, probably early fall in 1858-59. Shows the fort on the left-hand side. Shows way beyond, just in the, in the defile of the canyon there, Lady Franklin's Rock. And this is Yale as a burgeoning, booming gold town. One of the stern wheelers is at Steamboat Landing. And uh, this is the way Yale would have looked if you'd walked in there in the late 1850s. Got an artifact here that is from the days of placer mining on the, on the uh, Fraser River. What is this? Well, that came, that's a Chinese uh, copper amalgam plate. It came from an old Chinese store on Front Street in Yale. And the Chinese miners used this when they were mining Hills Bar. And Hills Bar was one of the famous bars of the Fraser River. About two tons, at least two tons of gold came off Hills Bar. And it was mined for about 40 years after the rush. So it started in 1858. The Chinese miners were still mining Hills Bar in the 1880s, Mike. And the reason they had this is that they put this in the bottom of their rocker because they were short of water, surprisingly, so they had to use it up on the bar. So they set up a rocker, two men used it, and this was a copper amalgam plate. And because, and it was covered with mercury, because mercury has an affinity with gold, mm -hmm. it was, the mercury was put on top and all the gravel would come over this plate in the rocker and the, the, the mercury itself would attract the gold or alloy with it and you would have uh, the mercury covering this plate and at the end of a week or whatever it was, the Chinese would, would blow off the mercury and just take the gold. They, they had a way of separating the mercury Certainly from the gold, yep. and all gravel and all other dirt would just float off That's the mercury, right. and, would, and it would stay here despite the fact it that... It would, until it became overloaded with gold, but they would know that. Now, as I'm looking across this, I'm seeing little f glints. Is, is there... Well, actually, there is gold in this. This is the original mercury, and it was in this bag, and the Chinese had not, for some reason, blown this mercury off. So if this, if this could be, you could recover a certain amount of gold from this plate. Now, where would you find a plate like this? Is this found in an old Chinese store on Front Street in Yale many years ago? I bought a whole collection out of Yale off a very fine man. I paid some thousands of dollars for his collection, and this was part of the collection. I got about 15 of these plates in the carrying bags. Gosh, the carrying bags are neat. So these these uh, bags go back to that same era, and they with the rope and everything attached. Those to Those bags them. are about a hundred years old. Well, I'll be careful of these. Or even older. Now, the, of course, the the thing which the miners, I guess, dreaded, maybe gold doesn't allow you to dread anything, but going up that Fraser Canyon, how did the miner get from Yale up the Fraser Canyon? Well, it was, it was very, very difficult. They had to go overland by little used game trails and so on because this was prior to the Caribou Road. And so they went through the big canyon. And if you read the original accounts and all the old uh, newspapers, the, the Victoria Gazette and the colonists and so on, literally, probably at least 200 miners drowned in the Fraser River in the first two years of the gold rush, 58 and 59. And most of them drowned around Yale between, between Hope and probably Lillooet. So Yale and north of Yale and just south of Yale. The, the, river, the Fraser River is a very treacherous river. And these guys, it was easier to go up the river than come down the river, because when you come down the river, you're out of control. Yeah. So did they try and canoe up the canyon here? They would try, raft no, up actually, the they wouldn't try and canoe up the canyon. They would go overland up the canyon, and some of them tried to shoot the canyon coming down, and of course, this was, this was a very hazardous operation. Over 200, around 200 Around miners. 200, yeah. These are the guys who did it. These are the guys who got right into the caribou itself. And this is the Mutuaro on, on Williams Creek. And this is probably taken in 1863 or 64, somewhere in the 1860s. And the gold that was collected on these great mines on Williams Creek and Lightning Creek and all the famous creeks of the caribou mm -hmm. would come down by express company. Now, there were a number of express companies. The first express man was Billy Ballou, the colorful Billy Ballou. He was driven to the ground by the remorseless competition of his, of his rivals. And so he, he disappeared, but in his place came a number of other companies. Barnard's Express, and Barnard's Express carried the treasure or the gold from the Caribou gold fields down to, right down to Yale. And then from Yale down to New Westminster, it would be carried by Dietz and Nelson. Uh, in fact, they would sometimes carry it right over to Victoria. Mm -hmm. And then from Victoria, the famous firm of Wells Fargo. And they would send it, transship it, to San Francisco. It was big business. There oh. are lots of shippers, lots of money sure. to be made in the gold And fields. they would get a percentage of all the gold they shipped to the gold fields, Mike. This is a remarkable little scale here. What was this for? 
that came, that's a provisioner scales for weighing furs and everything, mm -hmm. and that was from originally from Fort Yale, mm -hmm. and uh, it was, it's, it's, it's typical of the day. The scales is probably 1830s, I would think, because Fort Yale was an active fort only for a few years mm -hmm. until the gold rush started, and then it came back into the limelight again. Let me see. This, I think I had it on backwards there, but this, yeah. that's, that's the way it sort of would work. Approximately, yes. And then that would be where you'd hang the, the, the goods you're buying, that's and that right. would be the counterweight out there. That's correct. Yeah. Remarkable. Where'd yeah, you yeah. pick these? I mean, were these well, standard? Well, the, 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 this particular scales came from that original collection I purchased from old Gus Milliken. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Okay. The below the canyon, like the canyon itself, how long did it take them for to stop this business of going up and down the Fraser uh, on the water? Well, you see, what happened is that the, 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 until 1863, there was another route through, through, through Port Douglas, but they finally found that route was too expensive, it was laborious, it was time consuming, so they built the second Caribou Road. This, we're looking now at a picture of the second Caribou Road. This was started in 1863, snaked through the canyon, and snaked past various obstacles that were very daunting. The, the, the Colonel's Retreat, Jackass Mountain, where one step would consign you to a watery grave very, very rapidly, Mike. And so they had to build extremely carefully. Royal engineers built a lot of this road, blasting out foot by foot, coming up through the, the, the depths of the big canyon, and then going up, up the Thompson, and then overland from the Thompson up through Cache Creek, up through Clinton, and eventually into the Caribou Gold Fields. Yeah. They arrived there in 1865. They didn't do a lot of blasting in some places. They built it right out on bridges out of the cliff face. Oh, so sure they that. did. Here's one of the express companies you're talking yes, about. Yes, that's a later shot. This is the BC Express, which took over from Barnard's Express. This is a shot taken out of Ashcroft, probably in the 1880s, the early 1880s. And the, the stagecoach there is an Abbott and Downing coach and uh, um, some, with some provisions made for the rough rides in British Columbia, so they would add uh, further strength of the Abbott and Downings. They were customized from the kind that went across the United States, but it's essentially an American stagecoach with a heavier gear. Essentially it is, yeah. The Bank of British Columbia. This is the first Bank of British Columbia. This shot was probably taken in 1863. It might have been a little later, it's hard to tell. Um, and this is in Yale itself, right on Front Street. And this was one of the banks that received the treasure from the gold fields. So there would be the Bank of British Columbia and several other banks. Do you have any observation of what might be in that very strange looking wagon? I mean, it looks like it's, it's carrying a statue or some sort of strange wellhead gear or something. Well, it's hard, it's hard to tell. It could be mining equipment or, or mining machinery, and quite possibly it is. And this is certainly after the Caribou Road was built, Mike, because that, ro that wagon is ready to go up the Caribou Road. Yeah. This is the point where we begin to get to another treasure story. This drawing, we saw a drawing earlier that was pretty inaccurate. This drawing was done by whom and it's pretty accurate. This is done by an artist called O'Brien and, it's, and it's, a very, uh, it's a very accurate drawing of Yale and, and, the, and, the, and the mountains beyond and so on. This is 1880s. You can see the railroad track on the left hand side. But it does show that some of the steering wheelers were still coming to Yale at that time. And the story we're concerned with is about 20 years earlier, Mike. Okay, so around about 1860, the stern wheeler comes up just as that one did, yeah. just up the river. It it docks at what place? It docks at, at Steamboat Landing. Yeah. And in fact, if you went down to Steamboat Landing today, Mike, you would still see the old ring boats anchored in the rocks. They're still there at Yale. Very, very interesting, moody spot. And you can see where the old steering wheelers were pulling on these ring bolts because they're worn through practically. And so the, what happened was this. Is the, the story is rather interesting, and the story concerns the one of the express companies, Dietz and Nelson. Yeah. And Dietz and Nelson was the intermediary between Bernard's Express and Wells Fargo. And so a shipment came in from the Caribou, and it was, it was a shipment of about 20 pounds of gold. And that would probably be specie and, and uh, nuggets and What's, so on. What specie? Specie would be coins and so on, you see. So there might be some California stuff in there, some California private mint gold. Yeah. And there probably was. And there was, there was certainly some American gold, some ordinary American gold pieces, and some gold, probably some nuggets and so on. And it came in an express bag like this. Let's have a look at this. This is, do you know if this is in fact a Dietz and Nelson bag or? Uh... Well, this is, this is either a Bernard's Express or a Dietz and Nelson. This was, this came out of Yale. Mm -hmm. It's uh, probably 1860s. And this was the typical treasure pouch that they would transfer from the bank right onto the stern wheeler itself. And there's double, double sided. That's would right. sit over the back of your horse, yeah. of course. And they'd have bags That's put right. in here sure filled with the gold. Yeah, filled with gold. Okay, so I'm sitting on the side of the Fraser River. There's a steamer coming up, and who am I?
and you're just a bystander. Yeah. What has happened? Something is going to unfold before your eyes, and this is what happens. The, the individual, the Dietz and Nelson's agent in, in, in this particular area, and it may have been Higgins, it may not have been, but he, he forgot to put the treasure bag on board a steamer called the Reliance. And the Reliance was ready to pull away. He suddenly remembers. He grabs the treasure bag. It's filled with 20 pounds of gold. He rushes down to the, down to the foreshore, down to a steamboat landing. He sees a boat there. He jumps into the boat with the treasure and the bag, yep. and he rows out towards the Reliance. They see him. Some of the crew members see him, and they start to turn the boat back. And he thinks, and he, and he pulls up towards the stern wheeler, and he reaches up with the treasure bag like this. But there's 20 pounds of gold in the treasure bag, and just as the percher reaches for it, he drops the bag. With 20 pounds of gold, it acts like an anchor. It sinks out of sight, much to his astonishment and dismay. And so he has to report back. He <laughs> rows back to sh shore in considerable difficulty because he knows there's problems. And he informs Dietz and Nelson that the treasure bag has been dropped and he has witnesses to it. And therefore, they, they have to make... Dietz and Nelson then sends out word that anyone who would send express by that bag, they will honor it. Dietz and Nelson felt that they could recover the bag. And what, this was September the 11th, 1863. 1863. That's right, 124 years ago. So what happens is Dietz then gets hold of what he called underwater armor equipment, which is really kind of a deep sea diving uh, gear of the time. Kind of rough, not very good, but good enough, he thinks, to get down about 30 feet. Dietz himself comes into Yale to look for the treasure. But by then, the purser on the boat and the agent are not sure exactly where it was dropped, or nor are the other people. So he, tr he, he combs the bottom of that river. Very difficult river to comb because it's a, it's a treacherous river, it's a dangerous river, and of course, 20 pounds of gold might sink under the mud just slightly. Because yeah. it's been churned <laughs> up, you see. It's been churned up by the stern wheelers. It is low water because it's September. It is low water, that's correct. So he looks for two or three days underwater, is unsuccessful. But he is still convinced from all the people who saw what happened that it's still there. He goes back again and tries. He is not successful. He finally eventually gives up. He could not find the express bag. As far as we know, Mike, and it's quite certain from the documentation of, of this story, that the express bag, filled with 20 pounds of gold, about hundred or $125,000, is still down Current somewhere, value. somewhere, right? Current value. At those days, it was only valued at $3,700, mm -hmm. which was still considerable. So the company didn't want to take this loss. So it's still down somewhere just off Sternwheeler Landing, sitting in the mud. I mean, Mr. Higgins was a believable enough man, because I got a scenario which doesn't take much of an imagination. He says, yeah, I've been passing this gold along for a long time. I think I'll just empty this, load it up with some cast iron, run down there, oh, dropped it in the lake, and then I've got the 3,700 bucks that I can whittle away at my time. I may be insulting the Higgins name, but why don't you think that well, happened? Well, we're not sure exactly what happened, but if it was Higgins, at this particular time. Uh, Higgins' background, and he was, he was a writer as well, it indicates that he was not a thief. And uh, so therefore, and these agents were chosen very carefully. Wells Fargo chose their agents carefully. Uh, Dietz and Nelson chose their ag agents carefully. So does the BC Express. So did, uh, you know, Billy Ballou even. So these individuals, when they chose an agent to handle their gold and the treasure that came in, they were extremely cautious who they chose. They didn't just take somebody off the street. They had to know the background of this individual. So probably that scenario sounds good, probably didn't take place. I think it took place as described. $120,000 worth of gold coin and gold nuggets and gold powder dust somewhere there just off uh, Steamboat Landing That's right. at Yale. That's right. You can see the, 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 the you, iron in the walls right now where they tied up. You can see the ring bolts right there, and you can see where the stern wheeler was just pulling away. You know approximately the area, but it's probably 200 feet by 200 feet. All right. Going to take a break here and come back because, as in all of these wonderful pioneer towns, it had a, uh, a pinnacle of its success and its demise. And we're going to come back and talk more about Yale right after this break. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley. So this town of Yale started in the 1850s. Well, it started before that. It started as a fort before that, but the actual town started in 1858. That's right, Mike. 
and it, like all the others, reached its heyday and then petered out. What are we talking about for its heyday? Okay, you're talking from 1858, probably to 1864, 60, 65 perhaps, just after the caribou hit its height and then started declining. And it probably lasted to a degree to about 1869 or 70. Mm -hmm. By 1870, it was definitely in the doldrums. And by 1880s, this shot is taken in the 1880s, shows a fire that swept along Front Street and this was when the railroad construction was back in here, but Yale never really recovered from this blow. It might have just fallen into decline, but this certainly speeded that decline. This hastened it considerably. Did it destroy everything? It destroyed most of Front Street. You can see the odd building standing in the background that's a brick building, but most of Front Street was gone. Front Street would have been where you see right next to the river, just uh, just up on there, that's where Front Street is Just right up there. above Sternwheeler Landing, that's right, you can see it. And they're starting to rebuild a little bit, but most of that Front Street in this photograph, 1880s again, is gone. So Yale is virtually finished. And the reason why I guess they never built it is because the, the transportation method has gone from the right-hand side of the picture to the left, to the, the railway. That's right, the Sternwheelers were replaced by the rail. And uh, hence, no need to build the buildings there again. N not much. What is this? You know, Mike, that was a shot I took in the 1970s, and it shows an old vault, which, is, which was in the Chinese section of Yale, and it, it was, it was, there's, a, there's an old steel door that actually covers this vault, and the vault itself is made of, made of stone, very carefully pieced together, and uh, this was kind of a fireproof vault, so the Chinese could keep their valuables. They were afraid of fire whipping along uh, Front Street, and, uh, and of course they were correct. And, uh, you know, so they, they had to safeguard their valuables by using vaults like this. And that was there in the 70s. Is it still there today? Is there yes, much evidence? Yes, that vault is still there today. Actually, Yale has quite a bit of atmosphere, Mike. You know, you can go down on steering wheeler landing. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to, you know, to almost see the stern wheeler coming around the bend up from Hill's Bar. Yeah. And, and, and then you look over to the, to the shore itself and you can see the ring boat still in the, as I mentioned before, right, fastened into the rocks. And then up you can see the old, the old the trail that led up to Front Street. And then, of course, uh, uh, St. John the Divine, the original Anglican church, which is still there from the 1860s. Yeah. And, uh, of course, nothing left in Front Street but you can see where the miners once trod and where the railroad men came in after them. Then you look up towards the mouth of the canyon itself and you can see the defile and Lady Franklin Rock and you can, you can envision the miners shooting the river and coming down into Yale, glad to get there because they emerged from the big canyon alive. How big a town was Yale at its most? I guess it was a transit point so it, it, more people went through it, obviously. Actually, probably hit about 3,000, Mike. So that was quite a big town in British Columbia. Yeah. Victoria was first. Yale was probably at that time bigger than, than New Westminster. And then, of course, beyond Yale, you got into the Barkerville gold fields and Barkerville itself. So the caribou, the big town in the caribou was Barkerville. And the population generally is given of 10,000 in Barkerville. It wasn't 10,000. Yeah. It was probably 3,000, 3,500. Where are we going to go next time? We're going into the Caribou, one of the most fascinating parts of the Caribou, and an area that is not well known by most British Columbians. And it's the, it was the first big town in the Caribou, Quinell Forks, at the junction of the of the Quinell River and the Caribou River. It's Predated Barkerville. Predated Barkerville. All right, that's next time on Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. The town will visit Quinell Forks. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.